Okay, I think it's a it's a good time to to start. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you everybody for uh, for being here today. Uh, I have the pleasure to to introduce the the, the workshop we'll have today. It's a, a workshop that mostly relates to the the risk project. Uh, let me introduce you the risk. The risk is a project aiming to deliver a risk five based uh, platform for a space. So this includes the the as you can see here in the in the plot, the SOC by Kopham Geisler. It's a multi-core SOC. It's fault tolerant and it will be built on on top of NOEL 5 uh, uh, IP cores. Uh, this is a uh, quite uh, comparable to their uh, latest uh, their latest uh, Spark 5, Spark uh, V8 uh, processors for the space and. Now they are transitioning to to RIS five these these products and this will be part of the of the project. So I think I have someone. Okay, just comments from the chat. Sorry. Uh, on top of the of the SOC, we'll have a, a Extratum, the hypervisor by by Fentis, together with their uh, Listos operating system. All these uh, technologies intended to be qualified for a space. Then, as part of the project, we also have uh, Thales. They are the ones driving the, the end user requirements, and they are the ones uh, driving the assessment of the platform with their uh, use case. And uh, uh, BSC, where I, 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 I belong, where basically we are contributing to, to some technology in the in the SOC, as you will see later today, and also to the to the part of the validation. So this is the scope. Uh, the talks we'll have today are around these topics. And first of all, we will start with the, let's see the, the overall scope provided by the European Space Agency, which is kind of the end customer of this type of, uh, of platforms uh, for us. So just let me show you the, the agenda. Uh, as you can see, we'll first start with the, 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 the talk from the European Space Agency. Will be, it, it will be providing the context for all this uh, all this work, all this uh, technology that we are delivering, and then we'll follow the let's see the stack from uh, from the top to the bottom. So we'll have uh, then a Jim Miller room from a uh, Thales Research and Technology, providing uh, some some details from the end user perspective. Then we'll be moving down to the to the stack to the software layer with uh, Paco Gomez from Fentis. Uh, Jad Anderson from Copenhagen Geisler for the SOC, then Guillaume Cabo from BSC providing uh, details on, on, on some hardware components. Finally, we'll have a short demo uh, for, uh, for the Extratum uh, Next Generation uh, Hypervisor from, uh, from Fentis, and we will wrap up the, 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 the workshop today. So again, thank you all for being here, uh, and let me move to the, to the first uh, presentation. See if I manage to make this run. Okay. So now Hello, we... I'm Gianluca Furano from European Space Agency. So let me, let me share this one. Okay. Hello, I'm Gianluca Furano from European Space Agency. In the next 25 minutes, I will tell you something about uh, RISC-5 Adisa and uh, how do we cope with the fact that uh, in uh, Space Processor we have soft errors, which can be the contribution of RISC-5 in this sense. Uh, so why RISC-5 and why space? And that the system uh, were born uh, as dependable, were born uh, to cope with the fact that we have uh, to launch, uh, we had to launch at the time the Viking and the Voyager missions, uh, where uh, also most of the basic building blocks where we are discussing in the past days uh, were developed. So just to give some example, what was developed in uh, Viking and Voyager were E-square prompts, uh, microcontrollers, IDC, DAX, uh, and as well as uh, instruction sector detector and software languages. Voyager 2 works since 44 years and counting has reached well beyond the limits of the known universe. But just to give you an example on how this evolved in uh, 
the past year, we went from uh, the uh, 30 lines of code that were uh, flown on the Mariner 6 spacecraft in 1969 to, the, to Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter uh, in 2005 that flies uh, uh, more than 500,000 uh, uh, lines of code. Uh, and this, as a combined, in general, an extension of all the embedded systems that we see. Uh, in space, as well as in ground application, there's no alternative to progress. And uh, if you look at the trends, uh, the trends are very similar, although on very different performance and power consumption uh, uh, sky scales. Uh, between ground microprocessors and space one. What we see is that, uh, for example, number of logical cores is increasing. Uh, our GR740, our modern uh, workhorse uh, has four cores, uh, so still very low in this case, but more than one. Frequency is increasing also for space processor, although not considerably anymore. Uh, because it's limited by the silicon technology. Power uh, has plateaued in space as well uh, because uh, it, we are limited at the intrinsic dissipation limit of uh, packages. Meanwhile, game is changing. Game is changing. The use of uh, Go here is not uh, by chance. Uh, we have more processors. We used to have uh, very centralized systems with only one processor. We are going towards satellites with uh, a system with distributed intelligence, thanks to the ubiquitous use of FPGAs and processors. Mm, we see the need for on more onboard on processing uh, driven by autonomy and uh, autocoding. This is coming and is the big trend that I want to speak about at the moment. And we're talk uh, talking here uh, to converse, but uh, Open uh, ESA choice uh, was among ESA biggest successes uh, in, the era, in the era of uh, data handling. In uh, the space domain, uh, Europe uh, has uh, uh, up to now succeeded and remained competitive in several segments of the space market despite uh, uh, difficulties and uh, a much smaller size of this market. The strategy following its own line of, uh, of space processor that was made in 1992 um, has generated several uh, very successful, commercially successful uh, chipsets. Uh, and uh, when it was made in 1992, to the perhaps the only fully open ESA with significant backing that was Spark. Mm. Uh, this choice, as I said, has paid off multiple times. Uh, the fact that designing Spark processor can be done without any license whatsoever, uh, and this was the choice made by, mostly by Giri Geisler at the time for the development of Leon, uh, you might just see in the past uh, how many times Intel, MIPS, ARM, have sued individual companies that uh, developed processor using their architecture. I give you an example what happened in 2002 when uh, Lextra MIPS uh, and uh, Pico Turbo Arm ended both uh, the litigation with a complete defeat of the cloning companies, Lextra and Pico Turbo, uh, that were shut down and their clients uh, had to be transferred to MIPS and ARM. Uh, this, uh, we cannot afford this space, we cannot afford to be linked uh, to one vendor only, despite of the performance uh, consideration. So the result is now open either prevalent in the space market. Uh, uh, the state of the art in 2020 is that European market is dominated by Spark, uh, the Azure uh, Part here with several system on chip uh, on the market. Uh, ARM is picking up in space as well, mostly embedded in larger uh, system on chip or in uh, microcontroller coming from the automotive market. What I say here does the time for RISC-V. And uh, there's still PowerPC in the US market, but it's 
frankly, fading down. Uh, why, uh, what do we need for a future space memory processor? The quest uh, is to bring more functionality in a reduced component count, as everywhere in the embedded market. So this follows the system on chip trend. Uh, more processing power, because we will have uh, payload applications. Um, but um, we are limited by a limited user base. The most successful space processor, the year C32, the first of the Spark family, uh, sold on the order of uh, 16,000 pieces. That's not comparable to anything you have in commercial market. But we need uh, access to IP, foundries uh, for system on chip, uh, non recurrent engineering cost below 28 nanometers is becoming prohibitive for these numbers of devices. Uh, this is an example why there's no dedicated GPU for space. It's such a low term uh, product that cannot survive in this type of environment. On top of that, we have physics. Uh, so we have radiation, we have uh, thermal issues, packaging limitation, stability of power supply. All stuff that uh, is unmatched with what you can have in uh, ground applications. So we are trying to replicate the success uh, that we had with Spark in the 90s, in the 2020s with the RISC-V. Uh, most of it is, most of this effort is led again by the company, take the name from Jerry Geisler. Uh, in Sweden, uh, that has recently re released uh, several VHDL instantiation of RISC V that help investigate in full total application of, on specific target technology. We see this happening in short term uh, to, uh, for the user RISC V, a soft score for uh, radar FPGAs, mostly silings and uh, micro SMI. And in longer term, uh, we expect RISC five to be the core for dedicated uh, space grade system on chip uh, ASICs. Uh, I think guys uh, will talk about the different configuration uh, quite lengthy in the uh, in coming uh, uh, presentation. Uh, it's clear why RISC v is, uh, is, the, is the choice we are waiting for. Uh, it has the same advantage that, uh, that um, Spark had in the 90s and freeze the designer to implement whatever architecture they deem best for their application, from uh, low performance, low power microcontroller to high performance CPU for uh, payload application. Uh, the introduction of RISC-V in space will contribute uh, to provide a range of alternatives to proprietary solution. And uh, the concerns that are growing about monopolistic position in the market, and market are even more applicable in space than uh, in uh, in uh, ground application. And uh, the typical requirements we are talking um, for, well, besides performance, are the one targeting dependability. Uh, what dependability? We mean that a space grade onboard computer may have less than one reboot in 15 years to, due to all possible fault sources. So this includes soft errors, power faults, software errors. Uh, as a comparison, if you take a commercial 28 nanometer uh, uh, FDSOI, that's also very good in terms of uh, radiation, uh, on orbit, uh, uh, you have a single level upset rate on the order of uh, five uh, to the minus nine upset bit per day. Uh, that might be, if you make the calculation, up to few upset, upset bit per day uh, per device uh, in uh, case of solar events. Uh, for processors interested in the environment, uh, the upset rates uh, is assumed to be several order of magnitude or less. So the point is you cannot rely on process hardness only. That's what a lot of people do. You take an IP, you put it on a space grade FPGA, you think that your IP has become by magic space grade. No, you need to embed the full tolerance in the design. That's the single biggest message I want to give in this presentation. Fault tolerance is a multi-layer design. So you need to know 
uh, what your technology or software is uh, helping you to mask. You have to introduce error detection at uh, several levels in your microarchitecture. You have to introduce error handling because not all those errors are correctable. Some of the errors need, need to be managed. And provide this error handling at the upper level interface for the, for the software. What you don't want is that an unmasked, undetected error without any action taken by your middleman ends up in a wrong command that diverts your rocket from its uh, intended situation. This has happened in the past, this is still happening, and again, you cannot rely on process hardness only. You need to have this embedded in your microarchitecture. So, you need, it's important to know the impact of each mitigation step that you, that you know. Uh, the, this is, uh, uh, this can be roughly divided depending on, on the, the type of effect you're after. Uh, a modern uh, technology are uh, very sensitive, for example, for multi would be a bit upset that are very difficult to mitigate with standard error correction uh, uh, methods. You will uh, need to implement in the Niagara architecture things that, like cache interleaving, reduce uh, error impact. You have to work on software. You have you have to work on performance. The, the faster you go, the more you're sensitive, for example, on the single event transient in clock distribution. So each of these steps contribute to your architectural vulnerability factor with very large errors on estimation. So all these need to be extremely conservative. And uh, mm, on top of that, you have to implement this on reliable technology and to study very carefully your environment. So again, you cannot rely on, only on process hardness. About the microarchitecture, the single biggest uh, point uh, of concern are the caches. Uh, if you compare modern uh, and old layouts of system on chip, uh, it's evident that with the introduction of multi-core and uh, level, multi-level caches, the percentage of area occupied by caches has increased making them, by pure geometric uh, reasoning, uh, the biggest contributor on the software rate. Uh, this applies to all the large embedded memory present instead of the artists on chip, like GPUs, video processing units. Uh, caches are so vulnerable in absolute terms that small deviation for reality of the models and for errors, for example, different fraction of multi bits a second cause an acceptable behavior even when memory rights are protected. So, again, we need to be extremely conservative in our microarchitecture design, design methods. Uh, some reference to what I just said. The, all this material comes from several works we have done at ESA. I leave those to you in the presentation. These are all freely accessible. And most of what I'm presenting is on an uh, article that's upcoming uh, on uh, the next uh, edition of uh, Computer Science Review. Uh, so keep this uh, as, uh, as a reference point. Now, a few words on machine learning. Uh, RISC V for Space uh, development is deeply interleaving with the great opportunities that uh, machine learning development methods give uh, for future space systems. There is a big push to introduce uh, machine learning based system in space, uh, also for critical application. And we are here at the consumer edge. So we want to consume data with machine learning directly when we take to save on the clear bottleneck of, of transmitting space data to ground. Uh, and uh, we have to profit with this synergy to develop a better uh, system. And this is what uh, many IT giants are doing. If you look at the coming uh, system on chip from Apple, Google, Huawei, uh, they dedicate larger and larger uh, 
part of their system on chip on uh, uh, neural processing units. Uh, Apple uh, A12 bionic chip is 7%. That's not negligible in terms of uh, cost of uh, those devices. And we have been working in the recent, uh, not so recent anymore, uh, time with Intel on uh, the addition of our stuff in their chips and their stuff in our chip. Maybe guys that will tell you something uh, about that. I will tell you something about the results. Also knowing that the way we use AI, machine learning in space is not the same. We have diff different criticality level of application. If we use machine learning for mission critical applications is one thing. If you use it for simple image processing on board is less critical, we can afford to have a much as a lower dependability. The example are several uh, and for each of those examples, we might find optimal uh, uh, platform. In this sense, we are working on across the spectrum of uh, possible hardware platform to uh, find the best for each. And uh, we're already running machine learning application of our Leon and uh, RISPI prototypes uh, chips that are fully space qualified. We have some specific platform like HPDP uh, for high performance processing. Uh, we tend more or less to skip, even if a lot of study going on uh, GPUs for uh, space use for many of the reasons I said before, mostly the life, the commercial lifetime of this uh, processor and their general weakness to radiation. FPGAs tend to be the biggest uh, uh, workhorse for high performance uh, application. And we are using VPUs mostly from Intel Movidius in several uh, uh, missions or, uh, already. Application benchmarking uh, and validation hardware platform that can safely and efficiently run machine learning application on the edge is one of the defining either R&D tasks in the latest period. Um, why that? Because as I said, if we can do payload data analytics on ground, we save a lot on data on link and we can support on board decisions in a much easier way. Imagine far away probes, uh, uh, we, we can do a lot more with a lot less in terms of hardware that we fly. And we have done it. We have done it uh, in, uh, in the recent past. Uh, we have taken the Movidius chip and uh, we have flown it uh, on a mini satellite that uh, has returned the first uh, AI computed uh, uh, data on ground. We use AI here for to compute cloud mass to filter images with cloud. Uh, and these are hyperspectral images. The satellite is on orbit working since uh, September uh, last year. And so far this has been uh, very successful. So to conclude, uh, what future for space grade processor? Uh, uh, space grade processor, as you see, are the core of our intelligent systems. Uh, and uh, in the past, we have been designing them more as uh, very ro robust old style trucks rather than uh, race cars. In the future, we might need uh, both uh, with the same uh, architecture. Uh, uh, and uh, RIS-5 is an enabler because uh, we can have the same architecture supporting the two far hands of uh, our uh, needs. So in this sense, uh, your work uh, here is extremely useful. So this concludes my presentation. Uh, if if you are, uh, want to know more, these are uh, the details uh, of, uh, our, uh, of, my, of the material that I presented, including a roadmap for uh, RIS-5 in space has been uh, recently published. Uh, I'm uh, open for questions now, and, uh, and uh, thank you for your attention. 
Okay. Uh, uh, we've heard the presentation by Gianluca. Uh, now, uh, Gianluca, uh, can you see the questions and answer uh, option in the? Yeah, I uh, I do, but uh, if I do, I disconnect my audio. I don't know why. So I, I will read it uh, and uh, and then uh, maybe we can uh, I can start answering. Yeah, I mean, I, I, so you 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 can you you can see the questions, or uh, you want me to to read uh, them for you? Uh, if you can, if you repeat the question, if I if I open the Q and A panel, the audio disconnects. I don't know why. Okay, okay. So just let me provide you with the the, the first question so that you can uh, you can answer it. So we have a Thomas Hoberg who's asking uh, literally a uh, catch as the major fault area. Is that only after you have done things like in order fault or unlock step logic already? Or do you do out of order with just the uh, ECC? So I think he's asking for a... No, uh, it's, yeah. it's, a, it, it's really a, a pure um, cross-section problem. If you, if you take a floor plan, of uh, any ASIC, uh, any modern ASIC, you will see that roughly 80% of it is occupied by SRAMs used uh, by various level of uh, caches. So the probability of a single event upset, uh, for a single event upset of hitting a cache area is much higher. So this is the starting point. Then uh, is much easier with the microarchitecture to protect uh, uh, registers and pipeline than to protect cache. There's also this thing. And an error in cache uh, can easily uh, hijack any other protection in, uh, in, um, in the microarchitecture. Furthermore, if you're not careful with your software implementation, uh, data persistence in cache is very high. You can have uh, loops where uh, where uh, some variables are loaded in cache and be there for uh, forever. So if you don't uh, flush, uh, if you don't have support to flush periodically your cache or to invalid uh, mm, persistent uh, lines uh, periodically, uh, uh, this accumulates error. So all all those things make made the error in cache uh, much more uh, at an higher vulnerability factor than errors uh, elsewhere. And we have seen this experimentally. Uh, just uh, on the latest test we have done on uh, the Zinc 7000, uh, we have seen that uh, the two internal ARM devices work completely different if caches are uh, flushed uh, periodically or disabled rather than uh, used normally. So it's uh, it's something that's well known uh, for myself. I want, to, I want only to highlight the importance in it. Okay, thank you, Gianluca. We have we have uh, several more questions, so I will be providing you with them. So uh, Thomas is also asking whether the uh, median mobilius units uh, you use whether they are a, a special or a, an, an, or do you keep spare units to to handle faults. No, uh, the what uh, the Movilius units we, we use, uh, they are commercial units, so perfectly identical to the to the one that uh, are, for example, in DJI drones. Uh, the good thing that they have a Leon protector inside, uh, not fault tolerant, sadly. But uh, the other good thing is the fact that uh, uh, they are VPUs uh, and. Uh, in a certain sense, they are single instance processors. So, so you load the, the image to be processed, you load the weights, you process, and on the next calculation, you basically rewrite most of the internal memory. So you use a new device every time. And this is completely different from what you do on GPUs, where you have a process ongoing that manages the memory. So with some software tricks, uh, you can avoid the accumulation of errors and be less sensitive uh, to single event upset. Okay, the next, thank you very much, Luca. I think that was really, I mean, I, I, I really didn't know that, but it's very, very revealing. Just uh, one question from uh, Tony Pustinen. I hope I, I didn't mispronounce this too much. 
uh, he asked, what kind of budget does the, the Europe uh, space program have? And how does the budget compare to NASA, for example? And are there any short or long-term plans to actually build spaceships? Well, I think it's, it's a that's quite a, broad that's question. A, that, that's a big question. Uh, <laughs> I can tell you what I would like. Uh, I, uh, in general, uh, the value of avionics inside the satellite is roughly 30% of the value of its hardware. So if a satellite costs uh, 100 million, 30 million are spent on avionics. This is a rule of thumb calculation. And I would like, this is what I'm insisting with my management, uh, that uh, the same level of investment is done on uh, avionics, where avionics include all the digital electronics and components as well, uh, then uh, the same proportion is used on avionics than on other uh, subsystems. This is not the case so far. We are still lacking investment, even if uh, in the new European uh, Space Policy Program, uh, huge sums are announced uh, just yesterday. Uh, ESA space, uh, EU space budget, not ESA, of 13.5 billion was announced, and this is at the same levels of the one of NASA, if you look at the bare number, NASA only, because the U.S. has many other funds due to military and, uh, and others. So I'm hoping that a considerable fraction of that goes into uh, avionics. For, uh, especially for that, uh, in the past, we haven't been uh, that lucky. A lot of the delays that we suffered with the development of the Leon 4 were due to insufficient funding. Uh, we hope uh, that uh, with the RISC 5 we can do better. And uh, for that, rather than ESA fund, we rely a lot on EU funds like you're doing with, with the H2020 or uh, the Fusion Horizon uh, programs. Okay, I hope this uh, answers the, the question by, by Tony. We have a couple more questions from uh, Ahmed Kalaf. The, the first one is, what's the value for using, for you of using the same ISA for all onboard processors? What's the value driver here? No, uh, can you repeat the question? I've lost half of it. Yeah. Uh, what's the value for you of using the same ISA for all onboard oh. processors? What's no, it's, it's, right? mostly, it's mostly in software reuse. Uh, in the process of uh, brighting and qualifying uh, space software is extremely expensive, and, uh, and uh, so people want to reuse software across different platforms. And the possibility given by RIS-5 uh, to have the same microarchitecture, basically from microcontrollers to high-end processor, means that a lot of things like uh, basic drivers, uh, overheating system, uh, board support package can be compiled, can be reused. Um, so this for us is really an important, uh, this, the single most important feature of uh, RISC V besides this openness. And the last question from the audience is uh, also from uh, Ahmed. When the designs are qualified, uh, will it be publicly uh, available, at least for research? This is a, is a good question. There are some, uh, it's yes and no. We, uh, the, uh, we, we tend to have uh, some of the designs uh, in uh, open source, uh, and this uh, may be guys that can answer uh, better. Some of the full tolerant design are uh, is, uh, is or, or industry proprietary, depending on who does it. And there are also some uh, being, due to the fact that some of these design can be used also for weapon system, there are some uh, uh, export uh, and, uh, and diffusion uh, control uh, uh, regulation on that. So this is really on a case-by-case -case basis. The reality is that in any case, uh, uh, is committed to, 
to uh, provide uh, feedback to the risk five communities uh, and uh, especially what i said on uh, the vector extension uh, this is all these are all things that uh, which we will contribute in the same philosophy or open philosophy of the risk five community okay okay and, and now I, I think that uh, we can switch to just I'm trying to, to process all the questions in order and I have a, a couple of questions from the from the panelists. Uh, uh, Vicente, would you like to, to jump in and, and raise your question, please? Uh, yes, thank you, Jaume. Uh, my question is that uh, if it is foreseen to make publicly available the ESA benchmarks to evaluate developed platforms. Yes, for the benchmark, absolutely yes. We are doing uh, several benchmarking activities, especially in the area of machine learning. Uh, and uh, our idea is, our uh, target is not only to make uh, the benchmark available, but also the benchmarking platform. So, for example, if we have some uh, uh, test uh, and validation images, uh, labeled images for a certain machine learning, uh, we, we, we want to make uh, this publicly available uh, to be reused for uh, future platform benchmarking. For the benchmark, it, it, yes, because having a proprietary benchmark doesn't make any sense. Okay, thanks. Okay, so I think that uh, the, the next question is uh, from uh, Manolis Marazakis. So hello, Manolis, nice to, to meet you. Uh, just, uh, he said, I mean, he first say uh, thank you for the for the excellent talk and ask you whether you could briefly comment on the validation process. Whew, not briefly. <laughs> uh, the validation process uh, is a really uh, big beast. Uh, we have uh, even uh, internal European agreed uh, industry standards on uh, on, uh, on validation that more or less even preceded the, the old DO 254 uh, for uh, avionics. Uh, we have our own, but the concept is similar uh, that uh, goes into coverage, uh, code coverage, uh, test coverage, uh, uh, validation on, uh, on, uh, for a core on uh, different FPGA platforms. Uh, uh, it's a is an extremely thorough process that uh, takes most, uh, so if I have to put on a scale, uh, it takes 10% of your time to write the VHDL code, 90% of your time to do the validation, especially if you end up with an ASIC rather than an FPGA. So we have uh, some beasts uh, there to feed and, uh, and uh, to be frank, uh, the quality so far of our validation process uh, was good, but we keep discovering bugs on our old uh, processors. So the best validation at the end is the fact that to, it's also one of the reasons why we're going RISC-5, uh, being part of a much larger community than Spark uh, helps uh, uh, in general to have a, bet a better device. Okay, thank you. So look, and, and now the, the I promise the last question, uh, also from uh, Thomas Hover. Uh, do you see some reuse of the designs in military or critical infrastructure, uh, for instance, power grids or, or avionics? Yes, we have seen this in the past, and uh, and this is also one of the reasons why Europe needs to have uh, to keep and enhance its capability working on, uh, in general, safety critical systems. Uh, I wouldn't comment on military because uh, ESA uh, by charter is devoted only on uh, peaceful purposes, but, uh, but clear on whatever, whatever is uh, mission critical, safety critical, uh, you have to apply a, a very similar requirement. And on top of that, uh, this type of market uh, is kind of increasing. Uh, the, if we will have very soon ubiquitous uh, self-driving cars, to give an example, uh, self-driving cars need to have uh, 
very similar requirement in terms of uh, dependability of their onboard avionics uh, than we have on satellites. Because uh, even only if you take the example of soft errors, I said that soft errors uh, on ground are uh, three, four order of magnitudes uh, less frequent than in space. Uh, but you will have uh, more than three, four order of magnitudes of devices uh, on ground uh, than in space in case you have uh, self-driving cars. So all of a sudden, soft errors become uh, much more likely than uh, they were in the past and much more critical because they can kill people much easier than uh, in the past. So this is a discussion that uh, needs to be done and the importance of using uh, uh, fault tolerant designs at micro architecture level needs to be highlighted also for terrestrial uh, uh, applications. Okay, uh, th thank you very much, Gianluca. Th very, very, really, very interesting talk. And uh, I mean, and it was uh, really amazing seeing that uh, there was so much interest from the audience. I, I guess that uh, we cannot uh, hear the <laughs> the people thanking uh, you the, the your talk, but okay. uh, anyway. Uh, 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 I put all my references and the reference of what I talked about in the presentation. If you have qu further questions, don't hesitate to email me for all the others. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your for your offer for your offer. Uh, we are uh, like five minutes late, but I didn't want to cut the, the, the question and answer session. I mean, it was, uh, I think, very, very interesting for all of us. So hi, all everybody. So we are back here and uh, we will resume the, the session with the, the presentation uh, by, by Paco Gomez from, uh, from Fentis. So let me start the, 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 the video for you. We come to this presentation of the hypervisor uh, support for the, the risk uh, platform. Uh, my name is Paco Gomez. I am the director at Fentis. Uh, I am also the project coordinator of the risk project. Uh, I am going to present you in this presentation our technology and contribution to the project that is related to system software, in particular uh, to uh, support with our hypervisor uh, Stratum. Uh, this is the table of content of my presentation. I will start uh, presenting my company, Fentis, and then I will go uh, through the different aspects describing the system software of the D risk project. Uh, in the third place, uh, I will describe the uh, activities beyond the risk in the main and real-time building blocks that are uh, XNG, Stratum and Litos and then I will draw some conclusions to complete my presentation. I, I start just describing my company. Uh, my company is uh, Fentis. Fentis is an SME uh, developing system software for mixed criticality applications uh, located in Spain, in particular in the east of Spain, in Valencia. Um, we provide the Stratum Hypervisor as our main um, product. Uh, that is a hypervisor, bare metal hypervisor, uh, as I will describe in a minute, providing time and space partition. We also provide other uh, real-time uh, building blocks like LITOS, which is a guest operating system running on top of Stratum and uh, meeting the adding 653 interface. You will see uh, that we are very much focused in the aerospace market uh, at the moment, we have 114 satellites orbiting Earth and using Stratum uh, and some of them also LITOS. Uh, on top of that, Stratum has been selected by four additional satellite constellations uh, and also by two main prime contractors who are uh, have de decided to develop uh, mini satellite manufacturing series uh, for future constellations. Mm -hmm. As I said, uh, in the risk we play the role of coordinators and also the system software provider. That is what I am going to describe in a minute, uh, the system software of the risk. Mm, I can consider two parts in this software. Uh, the first part is the 
uh, embedded uh, modules, embedded software packages, if you like. Uh, and the second are the software development tools that uh, simplify the um, development of application based on this uh, system software. The first uh, block is the Stratum hypervisor uh, that uh, we have uh, provided within this project for the Tris platform based on uh, Rich 5 uh, and is associated uh, uh, bare metal runtime system that we call XRE. The second one is Litos, that is a guest operating system complying with Arink 653. And finally, uh, we will uh, do in a best effort basis, uh, we can support other uh, guest operating systems like Artems or Linux. I want to describe here the main uh, Stratum features. Uh, as I said, Stratum is a bare metal uh, hypervisor that provides you uh, time and space partitioning uh, and isolation uh, in all the applications that are running over the same hardware platform. Uh, to provide the spatial uh, isolation uh, each uh, application that we call partition uh, has a different uh, memory space and resources uh, assigned uh, and we provide a virtual execution environment that uh, is uh, giving the application the impression that is uh, the only one using the underlying machine. The Stratu can provide two types of partitions, normal and system partitions. The system partitions, they have special privileges uh, and they are meant to um, implement certain functions like uh, part of the health monitoring and also the management of other partitions. Um, Stratu uh, schedule the different partitions using a cyclic scheduler that is developed it's a static scheduler developed at uh, development time, if you like, at, uh, stat at uh, the beginning of your, um, of, of your development, before deploying, if you like. Uh, it also can delegate I.O. devices and their corresponding interrupts to partitions, and, and this uh, relieves the hypervisor to have to implement uh, all the I.O. devices within the system, just making it more complicated and more difficult to qualify. Uh, it also provides uh, uh, interpartition communication mechanisms based on ports, on sampling and queuing ports, that is, they are the highest part in, in the Arix 6.5.3. And finally, in the configuration of the hypervisor, as usual in this safety critical system, is static uh, and is uh, provided through XML files. This is a summary of Stratum. I wanted just to also to describe the evolution of Stratum and uh, what is Stratum and what is XNG. Uh, Extratum, uh, is, uh, the, the, the first version, has evolved for uh, 10 years and it has supported many instruction set architectures like uh, x86, PowerPC, and ARM. But uh, we learned a lot of lessons with, uh, um, with uh, this Extratum uh, and we decided in 2016 to rewrite the hypervisor from scratch uh, and this was uh, what appeared as a next generation of Stratum or XNG. XNG uh, has different purposes uh, that are described there. Uh, the first one is producing a more modular software architecture, separating the common part of the implementation from the uh, that in part depending on the instruction set of the processor and also the board specific part. Uh, this made the design to gain importability uh, to different uh, processors and different hardware platforms. 
it also reduced the uh, space qualification efforts to new platforms. Uh, there was also some further optimizations of the code, making XNG uh, faster um, with higher performance than uh, Stratum. Some inconsistencies in the interfaces were also solved with this rewrite. Uh, and finally, the configuration was made simpler and more modular. All in all, XNG is very close to the original Stratum, uh, in, I mean, at least from the software developer point of view, but it provides higher quality code. Uh, what we did uh, to put uh, uh, XNG to Stratum, uh, it is worth mentioning that we started with a version of XNG uh, that uh, was monocore, um, but was qualified over the C-Link Sync uh, 7000 family, and that features a uh, uh, ARM Cortex uh, A9 uh, processor. Uh, the first step that we tackled for this porting was uh, supporting multiple cores and um, this required the implementation of spin locks and barriers to protect critical sections uh, executed by different cores now in parallel. Uh, the next step was uh, uh, I follow this uh, strategy and that was uh, starting to port this XNG SMP uh, to Leon 4, in particular to the GR740, uh, for two reasons. One, it shared the same development environment with the uh, RISC 5 and uh, with the DRISC platform, and it also shared many of the IO devices. Uh, there was an additional benefit, that is that this Leon-based uh, implementation can be used as a term of comparison uh, when the, the risk uh, porting uh, was available. To perform the XNG porting to the risk platform, we have to perform three uh, groups of activities. First of all, we have to support the RISC-5 architecture itself and this uh, entail all the activities that are mentioned in this list uh, starting with the processor startup uh, also all the uh, interrupts and exception handling the hypercall dispatching then uh, porting the atomic operations that were provided in XNG SMP spin locks and barrier to RISC-5 then the multi-core setup and also in a physical memory protect protection and uh, management of the floating point unit. The second group was more related to the board support. In, in fact, there were the board drivers like the UART, the uh, interrupt controller, uh, and also the platform level interrupt controller and that uh, is still uh, one of the uh, work in progress activities and then the L2 cache controller. And finally, uh, we had also to support the bare metal uh, stratum uh, runtime environment uh, and this uh, entail a series of activities that are mirroring the uh, RISC 5 architecture activities uh, porting in, in, in the particular environment internal to the partition. The last step in, in providing XNG SMP in, in the DURIS platform is the validation. The project validation will be performed against the project domain requirement specification, which is a public deliverable, and the strategy will be uh, to provide uh, one uh, test case for each uh, project requirement uh, and, and this will be uh, written down in a software validation plan and that then it will be executed. Uh, the main purpose of the project validation is uh, to simplify the validation that will be required after uh, the project completion 
to be able to provide a fully space qualified uh, version of XNG SMP running over RISC 5. LITOS is the other real time building block uh, provided for uh, the RISC. It's a real time executive uh, which run on uh, XNG partitions. It's already running in two orbiting satellites and it has also been selected for two constellations and four large space missions, so it has a certain flight heritage. Uh, LITOS provides an uh, interface that is the Apex uh, adding C53 standard. It can be configured through a LITOS configuration uh, module and that specify uh, the maximum resources that are allocated to the services provided by the ARINC 653 API. Inside LITOS, inside a um, partition having LITOS, you can have different processes running in parallel that are 653 uh, standard execution threads. This, these processes, these threads, can communicate through intra-partition communication mechanisms based on semaphores, events, blackboards, and buffers, uh, all of them defined in the standard, and, and they can be scheduled uh, following the multiple scheduled module mechanisms and defined in the standard. Regarding the mechanisms that have to be implemented to use LITOS uh, as a guest OS, over X and GSMP in the risk and some of the activities are very similar to the ones that uh, were already tackled when uh, the risk 5 uh, architecture was supported by X and G and you have then list there uh, starting with XRE startup and finishing with the page table management. The final step to have in uh, the system software running on the DURIS platform is the porting of the development tools. There are two basic group of tools and the first group is uh, related to the uh, what we call the basic uh, software development tools just for in configuration of the XNG of an XNG project and also to facilitate the observability of the project during debugging provides providing some tracing capability. There are more advanced integration tools. Uh, one is an uh, Eclipse plugin that is called Stratum Project Manager or XPM. Uh, and the other is the Concrete Schedulability Analysis tool that is used to produce uh, schedules by, based on the application uh, system requirements. And schedule um, is uh, cyclic scheduler uh, defining a major frame and a slot assigned to each partition that uh, allows the partition to meet its worst case execution time. This completes the mm, description of our developments uh, in the project. Uh, I would like to put that in perspective, just talking about uh, what we intend to do with XNG and LITOS beyond the, um, project, the, the RISC project. We believe that the, one of the advantages of the modular architecture of XNG is that allows a separate validation for the three major building blocks, the common part of the uh, hypervisor, also the uh, validates independently of the ESA dependent part, and on the concrete uh, hardware platform that, that is used. The validation of the common part can be shared across different processor, processors and platforms, and this already simplifies very much the validation process. Uh, and uh, we intend for the ISA dependent and the platform specific parts to test them uh, using uh, test cases built on top of a complex guest OS as Linux that uses uh, very thoroughly uh, all the resources of the system and can discover many uh, hidden uh, problems uh, in, in the validation process. This is a typical space qualification um, process that we follow for SNG and you will uh, find there the well-known 
um, space qualification milestones, starting with the kickoff meeting and uh, finishing with the final acceptance review. Uh, you have in the first phases or the analysis and specification phase and the architectural design just to, uh, to uh, arrive to the PDR. Uh, then you have the phase of the detailed design and implementation and integration and unit testing uh, to reach the CDR. And in parallel, you have a validation and and product assurance verification and all the common activities that are running uh, across the project. If you take that uh, space qualification cycle, our idea is to have what we call incremental qualification in such a way that uh, the uh, qualification cycles in different architectures are overlap. Uh, we start with a sync 7,000 space qualification that we are currently um, implementing uh, in a um, project managed by CNES. Um, when, when this qualification is halfway, we believe that we can start with the Leon 4 qualification of XNG. And again, uh, depending on the market demands, we can have uh, different um, qualifications in parallel in the uh, pipeline, RMB8 is uh, one space qualification that uh, we need to perform, but uh, Leon 5 is another one when the uh, chip uh, and, and the platform is available, and RISC 5 can be tackled uh, towards the end of the project, uh, of the DRISC project. Finally, I would like to draw some conclusions of our work uh, in the risk. Uh, we believe that uh, XNG and LITOS has been su successfully ported over uh, the risk uh, in based on, on the NOEL 5 of Coban Geisler. Uh, we believe that the modularity of XNG and the openness of the risk 5 architecture has been instrumental to allow uh, uh, porting operation uh, within uh, constrained resources and time available. Uh, we also believe that the validation strategy uh, of the project will minimize the space qualification effort after the project completion uh, and will also allow uh, different uh, architectures and platforms to be qualified in a short period of time. Finally, we would like to invite you to a demo se session later on uh, we, in this workshop that uh, will show you some XNG partition partitions running on the risk platform and other programs that have been developed uh, in the project. Uh, if you want to have more information on the project, you can visit the project website uh, or connect, uh, uh, connect to our um, and social networks like Twitter or the LinkedIn group in which we regularly um, publish uh, information on the progress uh, achieved. Thank you very much, Paco. Thank you very much for the interesting presentation. Uh, we have uh, some questions pending. Uh, I see that uh, two of them are uh, for for you and the other three, I think that they correspond. I mean, the, the two we had before and another one that are more related to Jean's presentation in the, in the next session. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, I have a question here from Thomas Hover uh, related to uh, the language used uh, to the right XNG. Uh, he's wondering uh, if, if we consider to use Rust or Go. Uh, eventually, uh, uh, most of uh, uh, XNG is uh, implemented in C uh, with uh, some small part, something like uh, maybe 10% or something that is implemented in Assembler. Uh, so <clears throat> we kept the same language because uh, also our developers are trained better training that language and what we wanted is to achieve the objectives that I was describing before 
and rather than uh, starting with a new language that could have, uh, I mean, maybe some constraints related to the target platforms and everything. There is a question from Jose Martins uh, uh, regarding uh, uh, the use of uh, PMP, the physical memory protection for partition isolation. We use the PMP in particular, we use it for the IOMPU. Uh, we don't use a full virtualization uh, because it's still under development. And so in the first, in the version available today, uh, we use uh, para-virtualization. We find very useful to have full virtualization in that platform. Uh, and uh, when when the processor provides that, uh, we use it and we intend to use it in the NOEL 5 implementation when the H extension is uh, fully developed. How powerful is the NOEL 5 CPU compared to modern consumer grade CPU? He's asking, yeah? Okay, I think this question is uh, to be better answered for, uh, well, no, okay, yeah, th this is for you. Yes, yeah, sorry, sorry for bothering. No, no, uh, I, I was about to say the same. I mean, maybe the, uh, the, the most appropriate person just to answer this question is Coman Geisler. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I mean, uh, usually the space grade uh, processors are uh, much slower compared to consumer grade CPUs uh, because they, they have to be very much focused in what they have to do in a satellite. And, and be predictable and safety critical. Uh, last but not least, Manolis Marasakis was asking, the RISC five standard for several isolation prote protection features are not yet ratified. Can you comment if this is a major issue for your work? Do you monitor and contribute to relevant working groups? Uh, there are certain uh, features that, as you said, they are not yet ratified. One of them is the age extension, and, and the other one is the one you mentioned. Uh, what we are doing is an incremental approach to development. So uh, there is a implementation running from Coban Geisler, and we are supporting that, and we are prepared to do uh, modifications when the implementation uh, is changed, if it is changed when it is ratified. Uh, the, uh, the, I mean, the, the contribution or the monitoring of the uh, working groups, we, we, are, we are not ourselves full member of RIS-5, but uh, BSC and uh, Coban Gessler and Incidental Italian Research, they are, and we are monitoring all the working groups uh, through them. I don't know if anybody wants, uh, any of the panelists wants to add any uh, consideration. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Paco. Uh, I mean, if uh, no one else has uh, more questions, then well, I, I have I have uh, one more. Perhaps it's a bit uh, of of topic, but uh, it's just for the sake of curiosity. Uh, does uh, Extratum uh, provide any support for uh, for security? Is there anything that uh, you should consider at a hypervisor level for security in space? Uh, well, there are things to consider for security, <clears throat> in particular, <clears throat> well, the, the isolation is, uh, between the partitions is also helping a lot in security. Um, we also take uh, <clears throat> care of mitigating any covered channel or side channel uh, between partitions. Uh, uh, as if you remember, uh, inside the project, there is an appendix to and the requirement specification that is a, is a confidential appendix with some security requirements as, uh, as I said in the validation, we are validating Stratum against those requirements and uh, we will comply with them. And some of them uh, are related to the typical security issues um, that, uh, that I mentioned and others that are of concern of, of uh, Thales research in this case as uh, as user. Maybe Jimmy can comment more on, on security. Uh, yeah, this is definitely a, uh, an interesting topic uh, to, to address. 
um, we, we put a higher priority on the safety critical aspects, but uh, but uh, selectivity is also yeah, uh, a subject that we are uh, looking at quite close, close quite closely. Uh, there is another question from Angela Gonzalez Marino. You talk about using Linux for some application validations. Can you elaborate a bit more how this is working? <clears throat> so basically what we want to do is we, we have realized that when uh, you have a, a complex uh, OS as uh, Linux, uh, these, uh, this, I mean, the test cases are more comprehensive and they exercise more parts of the underlying system. So the idea is rather than uh, validating the instruction set specific part, the, the processor specific part and the uh, board specific part uh, with the uh, bespoke test cases uh, running on, on bare uh, stratum, we realize, and this is a lessons we learn from our uh, customers, uh, we realized that using Linux as the underlying system for these test cases uh, will uh, stress the system more and will be more useful for validation. So our idea is to write these test cases on Linux uh, and having them more reusable between different uh, architectures. Uh, all in all, the other interest of Linux on board, I, I didn't mention that, but uh, that has been mentioned in other uh, presentations, is that uh, uh, Gianluca just mentioned that in his presentation, uh, artificial intelligence and complex image processing, which usually they are running over Linux, they are more and more demanded on board. So we have a growing interest to have a, a good uh, support for Linux as guest OS over XNG. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Paco. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you very much, the audience. I mean, uh, this is making the the workshop more, more interesting, having this uh, exchange of uh, questions and, and answers with the with the audience. So now let's, uh, it's time for to move to the next session uh, by uh, Jan Anderson from uh, Copham Geisler. So let me play the video for, for you. Welcome to session four of the D-Risk workshop. My name is and the title of this presentation is the DRISC Nodal 5 system on chip design. The DRISC project is building a complete technology stack that has the following elements. We have the Extratum Next Generation or XNG hypervisor. We have a Nodal 5 multi-core system on chip design and that system on chip design is implemented within an FPGA that is hosted on a PCB board that we're also developing within the project. This presentation focuses on the system on chip design and the associated building blocks, and in particular on the NOL 5 processor. To get the context and challenges that we are trying to solve or address within the DRISC project, please also see session two of this workshop where Thales Research and Technology introduced this. To give some background on what Cobham Geisler does, um, I, I will show you this picture. We provide solutions for space computing. Uh, we do this both in the form of uh, fault-tolerant radiation-hardened AC components that we call standard products. And we also provide IP cores that customers integrate into their own system on chip designs to create their own solutions. Uh, we are particularly well known for the Leon microprocessor and the technology around that one. And this technology has been applied uh, at various places in our solar system, as you can see today. So now we have an interest in risk five and why is that? And uh, this has also previously been covered during this workshop by the presentation from the European Space Agency. So the Leon microprocessors uh, implement the Spark instruction set architecture. 
and Spark became a dominant architecture within space applications due to several reasons. These include Spark being an open architecture, there were multiple sources for intellectual property, and there is also availability of radiation-hardened standard products from several vendors. We think that RISC-V is a modern ISA that is a good candidate for space applications due to it also being an open standard. The modularity of the ISA allows you to tailor implementation to your application needs and adoption in the commercial domain could allow space industry to leverage software from other industries, other bigger industries. The, and this was previously done for Spark. When it comes to multiple sources for intellectual property, this is already the case for RISC-V. And when it comes to availability of radiation-hardened standard products, uh, we are not there yet with the RISC-V. However, today we have access to quite advanced uh, space-grade FPGAs, which allow you to take a uh, RISC-V soft core and do an implementation uh, for a space application. Now I will spend some time talking about the centerpiece in the DRISC system on chip design, and that is the Novel 5 processor core. The Novel 5 processor core is a highly configurable soft processor core that can be implemented either as a 32 or 64 bit RISC 5 core. The, it has a superscalar architecture where we can execute up to two instructions per clock cycle. And what sets Novel 5 apart from other implementations is the fault tolerance concepts. We make use of error correcting codes and general implementation techniques to be able to operate in the presence of correctable errors. And if we encounter an uncorrectable error, our full tolerance approach is that we immediately stop and we never allow bad state to propagate outside of the device. As you can see on this marketing slide, the primary feature set is uh, RV64GC implementation. Uh, I will talk a bit more about the different RISC-V extensions, but basically this allows you to run complex operating systems such as Linux. When it comes to performance, this uh, dual issue uh, architecture uh, compares quite well to other alternatives of uh, similar complexity. Going into a bit more details on the Novel 5 processor architecture, we support 64-bit base integer instructions. We have hardware support for multiply and division, atomics, single and double float, and also for compressed instructions. The supported modes are machine, supervisor, and user. And we also have a memory management unit as well as a physical memory protection unit. We are also able to support the 32-bit base instruction set. However, we are not utilizing that within the DRISC project. And for our next DRISC milestone, we will also uh, release the hardware hypervisor support and also support to user level interrupts subject to uh, any changes in the standardization effort that's ongoing. Uh, within the DRISC project, we are also implementing a subset of the bit manipulation extensions. And separately from the DRISC project, implementations of the V extension to support vector operations is also being investigated. The pipeline features uh, include late ALUs and a branch unit compared to earlier generation processors from us, we have quite advanced branch prediction uh, in this model. The processor also includes a uh, level one cache. Next to the processor core, we have peripherals such as the RISC-V debug module and RISC-V platform level interrupt controller. We go to great lengths to uh, conform to the open available standards. Uh, there is no amount of 
uh, vendor lock-in when it comes to our Risk V solution. So software designed for a Novel Five platform uh, shall be portable to uh, other uh, other platforms that also adhere to the standards. The Novel Five processor development is our first superscalar core, and doing more work per clock cycle means that we also put additional pressure on the memory subsystem. So the Novel Five processor development has been complemented by improvements in the memory subsystem where we have uh, a new uh, DDR2 and DDR3 SDRAM controller and we are also implementing extensions to the level 2 cache to achieve greater bandwidth to, towards the memory subsystem. I mentioned earlier that the Novel 5 core is extensively configurable and we have defined a set of standard configurations to uh, allow us to provide pre-built tool chains and the necessary software support for, for configurations that end users implement. So the configurations range from a tiny 32-bit implementation that you can see in the first line of this table where we have a single issue pipeline and we implement the core without cache, without MMU, without physical memory protection and no FPU. On the other end of the spectra, we have the uh, configuration, which is our baseline configuration for the risk, which is, which is, is a 64-bit implementation supporting the GCHN extension we have a dual issue pipeline, we enable the cache, we have the memory management unit enabled, but and we also support physical memory protection. And for the float, floating point unit, we have two different options, one which is high performance and consume more area, and one which is more resource efficient. Since our target for the, the risk platform is an FPGA, we also have uh, the option to uh, disable parts of the processor in order to save area and make room for other features in the FPGA. The Novel 5 processor core is part of the GRLib IP library that contains microprocessor cores and also a large set of different peripherals, communication controllers, and memory controllers. This IP library is available under a dual licensing scheme, so you can obtain the library either under a commercial license or under the copyleft GPL license. Uh, this is a fairly long-running hardware open source effort where the version 1.0 was released in 2005. So the Free open source release uh, allows customers to evaluate uh, our designs and it's also used within academia for studying this and extending it and also by hobbyists. The commercial license uh, enables proprietary designs and the commercial license also includes additional IP cores, uh, updates, fault tolerance features and allows uh, projects to get support from our engineering team. To give an example on how to build a system on chip design with GRLib, the steps required are that you obtain the IP library, you follow the installation instructions, which also includes obtaining and setting up the required EDA tools to do an implementation. Then you select a template design, you enter that template design directory and you typically issue one command to build the template design. Then you can download that design on an FPGA board and then you have a complete platform implemented. The next step is then typically to adapt this template or example design to your needs and go back to step four. So to obtain the free open source version of GRLib, you can go to geisler.com slash get grlib. And as previously stated, the, the free open source version does not include all of the IP cores that the commercial offering does. Uh, 
um, and we don't provide a support service for the free open source version. However, there is a discourse community available at discourse.grlib.community where Cobham Geisler engineers answers question about questions about the open source library and also about our software products that are available freely. Speaking about software products, for space applications, we provide a quite complete ecosystem of software. And our intent is to do the same for NOEL 5. We will make sure that the same level of software support is available for NOEL 5 and the DRISC platform. Uh, in addition to this, for RISC 5, as already mentioned, uh, the momentum and developments happening in other industries outside of the space industry uh, would provide even more software resources. The software offered today uh, ranges from BRC tool chains through availability of operating systems like RTEMS, Linux and VxWorks. There are simulators available for NOL, that can model NOL5 now for from third party resources because they model uh, generic RISC-V implementations. When it comes to debuggers, we provide our GRMON3 debug software. And since we implement the open debug standards, uh, it is also possible to use third party debuggers with NOL5 based system on chip designs. For hypervisor, the, the ecosystem is expanding for risk 5 and the focus in, within the DRISC project is on the Extratum next generation hypervisor. Now moving on to look at details of the DRISC SOC design that has been built using the Novel 5 processor and uh, building blocks from the GRLib IP library. The DRISC SOC has the following baseline specification. We have a general purpose processor subsystem at the top in the block diagram here, where we have four NOEL 5 processors uh, configured as 64-bit implementing the GCHN extensions. Within this subsystem, we also have simple peripherals like a general purpose IO port, timer units providing a watchdog and so on. And also we have performance monitoring counters. On the other end of the block diagram here, we have the memory subsystem. And within this specific FPGA implementation, we make use of a DDR3 SDRAM interface as primary memory. And when it comes to boot memories, we support parallel EEPROM or flash interface. We also support booting from SPI. And for non-volatile storage, we also support an AND flash interface. The IO subsystem, which is both connected to a high-speed interconnect between the level two and level three cache hierarchies, and also connected to the general purpose processor subsystem, uh, that IO subsystem provides for the DRISC SOC implementation two lanes of high speed serial links implementing the Space Fiber protocol. We have a two port Space Wire router. We have two 10 hundred and gigabit uh, Ethernet interfaces. The SOC platform supports also implementation of MIL standard 1553B. However, we are not making use of that uh, interface in the DRISC project. We support CAN flexible data rate. We have eight UARTs with uh, direct memory access capabilities. And we support low speed links as, such as SPI and I2C as well. Much of this IP uh, is leveraged from previous Cobham Geisler uh, component developments. And this means that a very large part of the building blocks we use here already have spaceflight heritage as part of other systems. 
when it comes to the work that we're doing specifically in uh, the risk in addition to tying together these different building blocks we are trying to address the challenges of supporting safety critical applications and preventing interference between different software images or software instances so one difference between the de-risk project and the other system of chip architecture that should be highlighted is that we take the approach of supporting safety critical applications on all processor cores and this is instead of having a dedicated subsystem uh, consisting of only real-time cores um, having a division into different subsystem worlds where you have general purpose processing cores and another subsystem with a different kind of real-time processing cores uh, means that you you have complexities coming up in the software environment where you need to have tool chains that handle the different processor configurations we avoid that in the risk by having one processor uh, configuration uh, i've listed uh, a subset of the requirements that we have on this soc design within the risk uh, and to go through them in order we uh, are implementing dedicated local memories tightly coupled to the processors. Uh, this is an, a convenient way to have access to memory where there is uh, no or little interference from, uh, from different software instances. We design the different peripherals to prevent cache evictions due to activity on other cores. So from a software instance perspective, uh, the allocations done in the different level one, level two, and level three caches uh, are, do not risk getting evicted due to activity on other uh, processors. We have extensive performance monitoring and debug ca capabilities uh, in order to be able to uh, have a good observability of the software that we're running on this. Uh, within the risk, we also have cybersecurity requirements formulated for the hardware platform, and we are addressing those by implementing various hardware features. The design includes an IOMMU to uh, provide separation or segregation of uh, the DMA-capable communication controllers. We have protection of critical configuration settings, and we all will also define the critical configuration settings for the full system on chip design in order to get the desired behavior, which may be segregation uh, supported by hardware or making sure that uh, arbitra arbitration uh, policies and so on are configurable in a, configured in a suitable way. We prevent uh, jitter or timing interference due to state being cap kept in caches or in uh, buffers such as branch history buffers uh, between different partitions. Uh, for such features, we have functional correctness without requiring software intervention, but we also provide extensive software control to configure uh, items or turn items off such uh, when it comes to features such as branch prediction. We have error detection and correction on both internal and external memories, and we also have appropriate reporting of detected errors. And the interconnects are also specified to implement quality of service, service mechanisms. When it comes to the risk platform use and availability, the next milestone we have for the delivery of the SOC system uh, is March uh, of this year. Uh, that also includes uh, a user manual for the implementation as well as a verification report. We will output the we will commercialize the outputs of the full DRISC stack in 2022 when the project ends. But individual building blocks for the hardware platform are 
already available as part of our uh, IP library. And we are also leveraging the SOC top level design and the work that we have done in the risk for uh, our standard product developments. So that leads me to the last part of this presentation, which is beyond the risk. So within the risk, we are implementing an FPGA platform, and as a parallel track to the the risk project, we have also started uh, an implementation effort for a bigger design as an ASIC implementation. So this slide describes a 16 core device where the processor cores are still grouped in clusters of four general purpose processors each, uh, where each cluster has a dedicated level two cache. We are adding in this design accelerators for high performance computation, as well as embedded FPGA. And we are significantly expanding on the IO capabilities of, the, of this component. So this is an in develop, a concept that's in development. We are not guaranteeing that this will end up as a product. But as one example of what such a product could look like, uh, we have identified a supply chain and done some trial implementations where we would target a 22 nanometer implementation. And depending on what target frequency you uh, use or what operating frequency you use, you get uh, different trade off between power consumption and performance. But when uh, when this architecture is running at 600 megahertz, you uh, could achieve 31,000 dry stone MIPS and have a quite competent accelerator performance, at least when it comes to uh, space grade microprocessors together with uh, uh, industry standard radiation tolerance. Thank you very much for listening to this presentation. Uh, I'm available for any questions you might have and for additional inf information about Novel 5 and GRLib, please see geisler.com or vis visit the DRISC project website for additional information about the DRISC project. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Jan, uh, for the detailed presentation and the amount of information you were providing us with. Now you have a number of questions uh, in pending. I think that uh, virtually all of them are for you. So uh, please go ahead and, and take them in, in order, please. Yes, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. OK. Uh, well, for the first question, are you from Gonzalo Salinas? Are you planning to generate ASICs with the design in the future rather than deploying an FPGA? Uh, this was uh, addressed uh, by the presentation. So we have this GR7XV uh, concept. Of course, we would have liked to um, do an ASIC implementation as part of the DRISC project, but the ASIC implementations tend to be fairly uh, expensive uh, when, we, when we need to target advanced nodes. Um, then Thomas Hagberg has a um, question, are you considering MRAM for the scratch pad memories? And within the DRISC project, we uh, have not considered this because we, we want to have the scratch pad memories on chip. And if we would move the scratch pad memories off chip, it would mean that we would start to consume a lot of pins. And so the, the FPGA platform does not afford this. Uh, for future ASIC implementations, uh, MROM is interesting, uh, in particular for space applications where uh, MROM is inherently radiation hardened for, for, for at least the, the memory cells. So it is something that we are looking into for the uh, future products, I would say. Um, then, Tony Pustinen uh, has a question, how powerful is the Novel 5 CPU compared to modern consumer grade CPUs? 
And well, Novel 5 is uh, performs quite well in comparison with other uh, superscalar in order processors. So uh, we have, if you look at the core mark benchmarks, we are at the same level as uh, uh, ARM Cortex R8 or comparing to the RISC 5 ecosystem, we uh, are, are at the same level as the Sci 5 7 series of, of processors. Um, if you compare to a modern Intel workstation that issues more instructions per clock cycle and is an out of order machine, uh, the, the performance gap between what we provide here uh, is, is quite big. On the other hand, the complexity and, and resource utilization and thereby power consumption of the, of the processor uh, is also quite different between since they are simply different beasts. Um, Fabio Federici has one question on uh, the benchmark analysis comparing OL5 to Leon. Uh, th they are quite similar in terms of uh, microarchitecture. We uh, we are leveraging a lot of the Leon 5 development, for example, when it comes to the L1 cache implementation and reusing that for Novel 5. So uh, I would say that the, they, they both the RISC 5 implementation and the Spark implementation are RISC machines. There is no magic occurring. Right now, they have approximately the same core mark benchmark score. Uh, looking into the future, I would suspect that there would be more optimization work done on the compiler side for RISC-V systems. So it may be that Novel 5 um, has a performance advantage over uh, Leon in the future due to better tool chains. Um, there's a question from Jose Martins. Uh, do you have a timeline for the release of next generation cores featuring, featuring hypervisor and user level interrupt extensions? And uh, yes, we, we have that. It is available on the Noel 5 uh, product webpage. So that's geisler.com slash Noel dash V. Uh, the H and N extensions will be internally delivered to the DRISC project in uh, March, at the end of March. And now memory does not serve me, but I believe we have the milestone for the public Novel 5 release uh, set in March or uh, July for, for those features. So they, they will be released within the first half of, of this year. Uh, Fabio is asking, is GRMON compliant with respect to the risk 5 debug specification? And since we have implemented the debug specification for the NOL 5, we do have a GRMON implementation of that. Uh, however, we have not, at least not externally, released any support for uh, connecting to risk 5 SOCs from other vendors. Uh, this is uh, something that we are able to do as long as they adhere to the debug specification. But right now, the work to support our own platform has been prioritized. But if you would like to use Yermon on a specific uh, implementation from another vendor, then, then we would very much like to hear uh, about that and the, the platform that you're interested in. Um, Tony Pustinen. Uh, asks how much does a Noel 5 CPU cost and are Noel 5 CPUs available for consumers? Um, the, I cannot comment on the pricing of the, of the IP core. It, it does depend if you would license this for an FPGA or ASIC implementation and so on. Uh, it's, you're most welcome to contact our sales uh, department and, and ask for, for pricing. The, uh, core is available for consumers through the open source version. When it comes to ASIC implementations, we uh, we are targeting 
space grade microprocessors and those typically have a price tag that uh, make them not applicable for consumer applications i would say and but that that only goes for the radiation hard and high reliability uh, asic implementations of all five the the soft ip core is available in multiple uh, variants and, and pricing levels the there's a question from thomas hogberg on the morpheus extended risk 5 vulnerability tolerant architecture and unfortunately i personally am not familiar uh, with that one uh, as as far as i can recollect right now well, uh, anyway so uh, i i will i can i cannot answer that question uh, live uh, the manolis marasakis uh, asks about features on the iummu and what we have used uh, in, in the current architecture is that we have reused our internal IOMMU implementation that we have used in the past for our previous generation processors. So this one supports uh, address uh, translation uh, and it also supports uh, access protection vector like you may have seen in previous uh, consumer grade processors from AMD. And you can also group peripherals into uh, several different groups and associate either access protection vectors or different page tables to these uh, groups. We have a running effort on trying to understand how to conform to the RISC-V ecosystem. If there is a um, shared agreement on how an IOMMU should look for RISC-V systems, uh, I, I will say that it's fairly certain that we will try to align to, to that type of solution instead of continuing with our own IOMMU, which is uh, rather based on uh, old, uh, older uh, Sun implementations. Um, for the last questions, how easy is it to add custom instruction support to NOEL 5? Um, I'm biased, of course, but modifying the VHDL more implementation of this, I would say that that is easier compared to modifying, for example, the chisel code of the uh, rocket chip generator. Um, we have on our feature list um, uh, the, an item to add a well-documented coprocessor interface so uh, that you can extend the processor by adding your custom accelerators directly connected to the processor pipeline. Uh, but today you would need to read, understand and update the, the VHDL code to add custom instructions. Uh, so it, it depends on your familiarity with v, VHDL and, and previous uh, experience, I would say. Uh, looking at what the internal progress, it seems that uh, digital design engineers can get up to speed quickly and work with the Novel 5 code base. Um, and for the last question, uh, what is the approach used for the interconnect quality of systems, uh, quality of service system? Is this programmable, fixed and adaptive? Uh, right now in the DRISC pl platform, that uh, high speed interconnect between the level two and level three cache is just a, a simple one layer AMBA2 bus. We have not yet addressed the quality of service requirements uh, for this. Uh, we only provide round robin fair arbitration. Um, during the, the presentation, I, I said that it was specified to uh, uh, provide quality of service requirements uh, or quality of service features. So this is currently an, uh, still an open item that we will uh, address during the remainder of the, the project. So thank okay. you. I will hand over to you, Jaume. Okay, thank you very much, Jan, for this long round of, uh, of questions. Uh, so now we can take a 
a short break, uh, we should be back at uh, 10 past 12. So it will be the, the last uh, the last uh, presentation, something one. So please be back here in in seven minutes. So let's take now a, a break. Thank you very much. Thank you very much all. Thank you very much the audience. Thank you very much, Jan. Okay, uh, I hope you are all back here. Thank you very much for uh, for, for for being here with us uh, all this uh, long morning. Now we have the last uh, less than an hour with a couple of uh, interesting presentations. So I will start playing the presentation by by Guillem from uh, BSC, and then we'll continue with a demo from uh, from Fentis by uh, Anna Risquez. So let's start just to make sure we are in time. Hello, thank you for having me here. Today I will talk about the role of hardware support, specifically performance monitoring hardware in safety related MPSOCs. As the complexity of real time applications increases, the market demands for higher performance compute systems. This leads to the increase in popularity of multiprocessor SOCs in such domain and the increase in system complexity of multiprocessors and advanced microarchitectures leads to the desired performance increase, but it introduces interference and variability. When using MPSOCs, we have to pay additional emphasis on identifying and controlling such sources of interferences in order to verify and validate our systems. Such validation and verification process relies on the use of performance monitoring units, or for short PMUs. While in general PMUs uh, are fairly simple, they can be leveraged to profile applications, enforce control, debug, and do empirical validation of models. And such tasks are much easier when there is the adequate hardware support in order to uh, perform them. A typical PMU will have several counters and interrupts at a given threshold, usually at overflow. It uh, will monitor uh, different signals, such as the number of instructions, cache misses, among uh, many others. In the PMU of the risk, we have extended such uh, basic features and implemented some features that are a bit more advanced. Uh, we have added an input crossbar that allows to route and signal uh, each one of the events to each one of the features. We added the maximum contention control unit that is a small module that tracks interference among the different cores. The request duration counter that allows to track uh, the number of cycles that a given event takes to complete and the concept of a contention cycle stack that are signals that allow to monitor real bus contention. So this has been the introduction of the presentation. Now, now we will follow with the design of the unit, the integration, evaluation, and finally some conclusions and remarks. So regarding the design, here we have the structure of the PMU. It is attached at an SOC level instead of being instanced within each one of the cores. And this allows for centralized access and uh, it monitors events directly from the core, but also events coming from the shared resources. It uses a standard peripheral interface. Uh, it is uh, fairly portable. You could use AHB, APB or AXA and events are obviously inputs of our unit and we have the capability of signal back interrupts that uh, allow control over each one of the cores. The PMU itself has a clear partitioning between the components responsible of handling the peripheral interface of the SOC and the unit features itself. This allows for easier portability and tailoring solutions for different SOCs. 
At the deepest level, we have the instances of the features we just mentioned in the introduction, but let's uh, give a bit more detail about them. So the concept of contention cycle stack is relatively simple. The idea is to be able to generate signals that allow to generate a precise breakdown of the execution time and be able to identify the sources of the slowdowns in the system. We can easily apply this concept for most of the common interconnects, but uh, gathering requests and grant information depends on the specific protocols. The diagram in the slide shows the, a simplified example. Uh, first, we have core zero that is issuing a request. Since no one is using the bus, the request is granted and core zero becomes the owner without causing any contention. One cycle later, core one and core zero want to access the bus and they happen to do the request at the same time. Do the arbitration policies of the SOC. In this case, uh, C0 will become the here, C0 will become the owner of the bus, and C1 will suffer of several cycles of contention. With the CS CCS, we can measure the actual contention on the bus rather than having to pessimistically assume that all the accesses to shared resources cause contention. Um, CCS measures can be included in software or hardware contention control mechanisms without any drawback and providing more fair and accurate control. The maximum contention control unit aims to bound timing interference through quota allocation. This unit allows to set an interference threshold in clock cycles for each one of the cores. Each event has a weight that corresponds with the worst contention that is expected to cause, and at each, at each cycle, uh, the available quota is recalculated based on the active events at that point. This allows us to easily set the interference that we want to allow for each uh, one of the cores and control the cores that have exceeded the quota through the interrupts. The request duration counter allows to measure the pulse length of a given event. In other words, how many cycles it takes to complete a given event such as a memory response. With adequate input signals, the unit allows to easily identify maximum value for latencies and continuous interference. It can be used while profiling to verify that the specs match empirical results, but it can also be used along the final application to detect unexpected interference due to edge cases that may not be identified before deployment. To the interrupts, course could take corrective actions and fall back to a safer state. Finally, the crossbar allowed to route all the events to all the internal features of the PMU. This provides high flexibility while profiling, allowing to perform measures in a single run, instead of having to repeat the experiments with different set of signals each time. And in addition to that, it also reduced the need of developers to having to perform any FTL modification and thus this avoid to rerun the FPGA implementation flow that is fairly time consuming. We think that the crossbar is a fairly convenient feature and even some final applications may consider to, to include it. Obviously, in highly constrained systems where hardware costs needs to be minimized, it could be removed or replaced by a simpler routing mechanism. Currently, the unit has been integrated with AXI and AHB-based SOCs. 
the structure of the module allows to be easily ported among different pro uh, protocols. The protocol only has to capture the request and place them within a small memory. Then, the agnostic interface is capable to update the internal values of the unit uh, and also update the, inter the external memory when there is a read request. Not having to modify the internal layers simplifies uh, verification. In addition, the agnostic interface has been parameterized to allow for cost-effective solutions that can be tailored for different SOCs. Parameters allow to increase the number of monitor signals for each individual feature and also the resolution or the depth of uh, the counters. Nevertheless, one of the challenges of parametrization is verification. We have specs and direct tests for each one of the submodules and also for the integration among them. We have used cover and assert statements uh, throughout the RTL and software tests can be run on FPGA emulation platforms and the unit includes some self-test modes that allow to bypass the inputs and therefore achieve consistent results through uh, the execution of this test regardless of the target SOC. So far we have integrated our unit in three different platforms. As I'm sure you, you, you will know by now, uh, the RISC platform is based around Cobham Geisler Noel 5 processor and we have used a four core configuration for most of our experiments. The unit has been easily ported between Noel 5 and Leon 3, confirming the great effort that Cobham has made in order to make the transition between Spark and RISC 5 processors as seamless as possible. We also test the unit with our in house RISC 5 processor named Lagarto and we hope to include the unit in the following tapeouts. We have used the RISC and Noel 5 as our main development platforms, as I was saying before. On the right, you can see a simplified diagram of the MPSOC. For the Noel subsystem, we use the 64-bit version of the course, a quad-core configuration with private L1s and share L2s. The hardware target we were using was the KCU105, and this is an Shilings FPGA. It provides a decent amount of resources and it allows us to implement such Noel 5 multi core systems. The PMU leverages the plug and play support provided in current and previous. Uh, Kofham Geisler SOCs. Uh, using this feature is fairly easy. We, we had to wrap our system Verilog with a BHDL layer, develop an AHB interface for the PMU, since this is the, the bus uh, interconnect that is used in this platform, and interface the interrupts with the interrupt controller of the platform. But this case is a, a standard plic controller defined by the RISC-V specification. The real challenge, uh, in our opinion, is to generate and route the signals of interest from each one of the cores to our unit. We gather over 40 signals that includes typical events such as instructions, misses, but also other events as such contention and latency that come from the AHB and memory buses. Routing and generating the right signals may seem trivial, but it require, requires of an intrinsic knowledge of the SOC, the core architecture, and the RTL. On the SOC side, bus monitoring can be reused among different platforms. Finding the right place to instance these signal generators may require some work, but the logic can be reused among the different systems. Signals intrinsic to the course are 
specific for its implementation, they tend to be deeper into the design that requiring to expose the signal among different interfaces. So identifying these signals on an early development stage reduces the integration effort significantly. Luckily for us, uh, Kopfhan Geisler had these considerations in mind uh, and most of the signals were already available or have been exposed over the last month working on the risk. To give a bit more of scope, let me show you some evaluation regarding functionalities and resource utilization. When providing a system, we can start by using the request duration counter along some specific uh, kernels that are designed to stress the memory hierarchy, for instance. Our module can be used to trace the complete system latency. And in this case, table two shows the cycles recorded for completing an instruction or a data miss in the L1 cache. From this, we can set our expected worst contention for each of the events. And such measures will be useful to set the control mechanisms, the cont contention control mechanisms, regardless if they are using uh, software or hardware support, such as the MCCU. In addition, the request duration counter can remain active throughout all the execution, even uh, in the final deployment, to ensure that uh, the stress kernels have triggered the worst case for each one of the measures. To test effectiveness of the MCCU, we have run the EMDC, Catchbuster benchmark, in one core while the other uh, were running contender tasks, in this case microkernels. On the graph, we see, first of all, the execution in isolation. Uh, in the second column, we have the execution time when the contenders run completely unconstrained. That means without any uh, contention control mechanism to, to limit this interference. The third column shows execution time when the main core is periodically pulling the counter values and calculating the expected interference uh, and deciding when a core needs to be halted. Finally, on the fourth column, uh, we show the execution time when using the MCCU, that would be the hardware support. Contention is track by hardware and an interrupt is signaled when a given interference threshold has been exceeded. Each one of the cores has its own interrupt, so it doesn't pro produce any overhead on, on the other uh, cores running the tasks. So from the graph, we can definitely see that interference needs to be bounded and we can either use the software or hardware methods in order to achieve that. Uploading the control to a hardware mechanism reduces the overhead of the control calls, and in our opinion, it also simplifies software development. So with the CCS signals, in addition to the MCCU, we can obtain even more accurate control since now we are measuring the real contention rather than having an estimate from the events. Performing several cache misses may or may not cause any contention. If they don't collide, uh, the requests are harmless, but if there is collision, then we, we have this uh, contention. Thus, if we use real contention values or the measures of the CS, CCS, uh, we are providing a more fair control over the system. In this diagram, we show the actual breakdown of the AHB bus contention due to collision among the different cores. And in this case, we were also running the cache buster and different microkernels. 
since the contender workloads are almost the same and we have round robin arbitration on the SOC, we can see that uh, the split of contention among the different cores is fairly even in all the configurations. Moving into the resource utilization aspect, uh, our PMU, when targeting the KCU 105, manages to achieve the default 100 MHz operation frequency and higher clock speeds could be achieved in the same platform. Resource utilization is mainly allocated to the typical PMU features, such as counters or the memory interfaces. And the proposed advanced features represent around one third of the total utilization, as we can see in the pie charts in the picture. In our application, the complete uh, unit with AHP support uses around four kiloloots and 2,500 flip-flops. But as we said before, configuration could be modified to increase functionalities or reduce resource utilization. In addition to FPGA results, we perform some early ASIC scaling exploration for each of the features. With Yosis, we were able to map the implementation to an academic uh, PDK this is called free PDK and it maps uh, to 45 nanometer technology. This early evaluation shows that operational frequency for each of the features in different configurations from 4 to 256 uh, events achieve a minimum operational frequency of 1 GHz, even when using the large configurations. And we can say that it's unlikely uh, to have the PMU in the critical path of uh, future implementations. In any case, if needed, we could pipeline some of the uh, units and increase the operational frequency. Using the same tools, we got area utilization for the configurations ranging from 4 to 256 events. And to be clear, we don't, we don't expect to, to be using 256 events for each feature simultaneously, but uh, results have been included to have a better view of, of the scaling. We can see that all the features scale linearly with the number of events. And also we can see that the cost per event of uh, the request duration counter and MCCU is around half of the cost of adding a new counter. These results match the ones obtained on the FPGA, but uh, provide a more clear visualization since only area uh, needs to be reported. As conclusions, any RTL IP requires of a solid structure that matches the goals of the project. In our case, clearly defining an internal interface that generates the IP itself, an external layer that handles the specifics of the bus protocol has been fairly important and allow us to port it among the different platforms. The use of our request duration counter uh, help us to verify the worst case estimates for contention and also for latencies and it did make the process much simpler and direct. In addition, with the correct configuration of the unit, work cases can be constantly evaluated without any penalty on the software performance, and it helps to increase the confidence on the profiling. Also, uh, having the option to, to rise interrupts at a given threshold uh, and taking corrective actions, it's fairly interesting and allows for fail-safe mechanisms. The MCCU has low overhead and offloads the contention control to the hardware, thus reducing the software overheads as well and the risk of overrunning deadlines due to slow pooling rates. Finally, the addition of CCS signals allow for more accurate and far control regardless if we are using a software control mechanism or hardware support like the MCCU. And it also eases the profiling of applications and provides a clear breakdown of 
such interference. So in the future month, uh, we plan to keep working on the unit in order to harden the IP and adding some fault detection and fault correction mechanisms. Some of them would be really simple, so replications or checksums, but the challenge would be to make uh, this in an efficient fashion and reducing the amount of hardware resources. Another area of research that could be fairly interesting is the idea of having different distributed PMUs on a large system. And we would like to explore how statistics can be used in a large network on chip uh, with different compute elements that have different access latencies and how we can gather all this information in a effective uh, fashion and still be able to perform control that ensures uh, bounded contention. So I hope you have enjoyed the presentation. Feel free to contact me at my email and follow the risk on social media if you wish. Thank you very much and it has been a pleasure to be here. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Guillem, for your, for your presentation. Uh, I think we have a question from the audience, but okay, let me let me see uh, because they are asking about the uh, uh, whether the cell for microkernel have any applicability in the words uh, Guillem mentioned. What about the risk project? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, um, okay. uh, I'm I'm not familiar with the this particular uh, microkernel. But any application that stresses the architecture and allow us to profile and obtain uh, worst cases for the given uh, contention events uh, are, are welcome. And it's important to use diverse set of, of microkernels and tasks in order to, to explore the, the worst cases. Yeah, I, in relation to this, I, I would like to ask uh, something. Uh, Although not expl uh, explicitly included in the risk, uh, as part of the work we are doing at BSC, we are developing a, a traffic injector, a hardware traffic injector, uh, that uh, we are uh, starting to use for the for the validation, for instance, of the PMU for the validation of the of the arbitration policies in in the bus, and in fact, it's a way of having a configurable. Uh, a microkernel for a for a traffic generation and in fact uh, the, it, I mean the initial experiments we are performing show that uh, it's uh, quite effective because it it allows to for instance uh, inject a specific traffic patterns in the bus uh, with a uh, varying uh, bars lengths uh, with a uh, read request write request so in in that sense uh, I mean we have a micro benchmarks that allow us to inject the traffic uh, of course, I mean we are uh, happy to have uh, more benchmarks because, see, in fact, we have uh, we are in the phase of the project where we are developing the the, the validation uh, approach, and and I mean one of the, of them consists in uh, on using uh, benchmarks, and I mean this is one that we perfectly uh, could use if it's really a benchmark we can uh, we, we can run on the on the platform. So in, in that sense, it's something that uh, I mean we'll be happy to use. I mean, part of the of the work uh, we are doing is validating that the uh, uh, the platform is not only functionally correct, but uh, performance-wise uh, is providing a let's say high and a fair performance, uh, especially in the context of uh, multi-cores and safety-critical systems. I hope more or less this uh, answers the question. In any case, I mean, here you have a, a EM's email or, or the contact email for the project. I mean, we'll be happy to to take any any follow up discussion on on this. Okay, I see a question uh, from uh, from Thomas Hoberg on, uh, on whether PM, PMU statistic counters can help identifying attacks, uh, for instance, uh, site channel attacks or how much is this part of uh, what you do here? Well, in, in fact, uh, I mean, I, well, I, I can take it or Guillem, if you want to take it, uh, you can take it as you prefer. 
Yeah, uh, well, uh, I'll, I'll let you take this one. Okay. Uh, okay, so uh, typically, I mean, the PMU is uh, intended to, to, I mean, it provides control uh, on the interference uh, the course can experience. For instance, the MCCU provides this control where you can set quotas. So it's a way, for instance, in case of attacks, to limit the impact of an attack. And it also allows monitoring interference through the through the CCS. So measuring the actual uh, interference in the in the in the bus in the in the shared resources. So basically, if there's an attack, uh, in a, an attack, well, at, at the end, it's, if you see some unintended behavior, either because of an attack or because of a software error, I mean, uh, the CCS of the PMU will be will be showing this information in indeed and it, it will be reporting a hike in a interference from a one core on another so yes the, the the well although the pmu was intended for a let's say for safety in in essence it also helps uh, for a, some uh, some parts of uh, of the security process in in the system mm -hmm. yeah i would like to add as well that uh the impact on on side channel attacks uh, at the end depends on the signals that you are gathering from the from the soc so in our case uh, i think that the signals we are using are, are safe to 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 use and uh, it's uh, one of the the areas that we have to look into okay so uh, I see there's no further questions, so I think it's time to move to the to the last presentation. We have the the uh, NXG uh, demo from uh, from Fenty, so let me play the video for you. Hello, everyone. My name is Anna Risquez. I'm the marketing manager and project assistant at Fenty Innovative Software Solutions, also known as Fentis. And I'm going to show a demonstration of the RISC platform running a better Linux distribution and the Stratum Next Generation Hypervisor by Fentis. The content of this presentation will be the following. First of all, we will cover the board information. After that, we will see the Linux bare metal over the RISC platform. We'll see XNG XRE over the RISC platform. And finally, we will cover the future work. The DeRis platform is based on the ceiling Skintex Ultrascale KCU105 FPGA. This FPGA is based on the SYNC system and chip XC7Z070 system controller, which includes a USB JTAG interface and different clock sources. It has 2 GB of volatile RAM, 64 MB of non-volatile flash memory, and some kilobytes of EEPROM. The board comes with all these peripherals, among others. For further information, you can access the link of the manufacturer. This first block of the demo will consist of the execution of a bare metal Linux embedded distribution. The best term used to burn the FPGA is the one available in the Coven Geisler website. You have here the main features of this bitstream. The Linux image has been built with Buildroot version 2020.08. This tool allows us to create a cross-compiled bootable Linux image, including the tool chain and a set of user space applications. The version of the kernel is 5.7.19 and the tool is available at the Calvin Geisler website. In this block, we'll see several user applications running in the console, and after that, the execution of some benchmarks. Let's start with the Linux utilities. This demo starts with the Linux image already loaded in the board, as it takes 3-4 minutes. We can see Linux booting and reaching the command prompt to log in as root. At this point, we will use typical command line utilities to perform some operations with increased difficulty. We start cleaning the console. Then, we use unname 
to show the name, version, and other details about the current machine and the operating system running on it. Then we perform an echo using the hello world string. Then we show the hostname of the machine and retrieve the network interface configuration of the system. Finally, we do a ping against itself. We can list the current processes running on the system as you see with the ps command. And now we are going to play with the file system. First of all, we list the contents of the home folder which is empty, it doesn't have any user files. We create a directory named the risk, list it and enter it. Now we create the file txt. We list the directory contents. We write some content. And finally, we save it. We list the contents of the file txt and move to the previous directory, listing its contents again. After that, we compress the debris folder, listing it again. Then, we try to remove this folder, but we cannot since it is not empty, so we remove the existing file. Finally, we list again the contents, we unzip the previous compressed file, and we list again the contents of the directory and the file txt. Let's see now the execution of some benchmarks. Although the results of these benchmarks are included in the slides, they are out of the scope of this demo. Tristone is a synthetic computing benchmark program, which is representative of general processor performance. The output of the benchmark is the number of tristones per second, understanding a tristone as the iteration of the main code loop. Here you have the execution at three times accelerated speed. The result of this benchmark is almost 150,000 tristones per second. The next benchmark is called RAM speed. It is a cached and memory performance benchmark of computer systems writing with increasing power of two blocks of data. It consists of several parts, but we will just run the part corresponding to the integer writings. Here you have the results for your reference. This clip of video shows the execution of the RAM speed benchmark in 60 times accelerated speed. The next benchmark is another synthetic one 
for evaluating the performance of computers. It primarily measures the floating point arithmetic performance, giving the output a million of Weston instruction per second. This video clip shows its execution and the result. To finish this block, we will show the shutdown of the operating system. In the second block of this demo, we will show the examples that come along with Extradom X and Y, and later on, an ad hoc example will be showed. All these examples are based in the Extradom Runtime Environment, XRE, and you will see that they all start loading the binary image in the board through the corresponding yearmon command. The base term used to burn the FPGA is the one available just to the risk consortium, therefore it is not publicly available. These are the main features of the bitstream. This is a very simple and typical example. The hello world prints in the console the text hello world in some different languages. Before the printed greeting, the program shows the partition identifier where it is being executed, partition 0. There is just one partition in execution, P0, and its scheduling consists of a major frame of 1 second and a P0 offset of 500 milliseconds which lasts another 500 milliseconds. Each of the messages are printed in the corresponding partition 0 slot in a different major frame. When all the greetings have been printed, the program finishes and the hypervisor changes to the halted operating mode. When transitioning to this mode, Extratum X and Y deactivates the scheduling. Once Extratum races to halted mode, the hypervisor requires an external entity, such as a manual restart or a watching dog, to perform a reset for restarting its execution. This will be a common behavior in almost all of the other examples. In this second example, two partitions, source and destination partitions, send data through a queuing tunnel. The scheduling is a major frame of 4 seconds, a source partition offset equal to 0 milliseconds and a duration of 1 second, and a destination partition offset equal to 1 second and a duration of another 1 second. The source partition sends messages until the limit of 16 messages is reached waiting for the next slot. Then the destination partition reads these messages, cleans the channel to allow the sending of following messages, prints them, and it waits until the next slot. In the following major frame, just one message is sent by the source partition, read by the destination partition and finally printing it. The example finishes when the destination partition reaches the end of its code invoking the x hat hypervisor hypercool. This example shows how to reset the hypervisor and how to switch after the reset the extratum configuration, particularly the scheduling. Two schedules will be used. The first one will contain one system partition with a specific major frame, offset and duration. And the second one will contain just a normal partition with a different scheduling. During the first scheduling, the system partition resets four times the hypervisor. The last time it is resetted, the scheduling is switched to the second one, where the partition is configured as a normal partition. When the normal partition tries to invoke the corresponding hypercall to get the status of the hypervisor, an exception is raised and the system is halted since a normal partition has no right to run this hypercall. In this example, three partitions will exchange data through sampling channels. The scheduling is 
source partition of set equal to zero milliseconds and a duration of one second, destination partition zero of set equal to two seconds and a duration of also one second, destination partition one of set equal to four seconds and again a duration of one second, and all in a major frame of six seconds. In this case, there are two destination partitions which are receiving the message from one partition source. Messages are first put in the channel by the source partition and later the destination partitions read from the channel through their corresponding ports. All the partitions are being executed in the same core in their assigned time slots. The example ends in the same way as the hello world example. This example deals with sampling ports again, with a difference respect to the previous one in the number of cores being involved. The scheduling is the one shown in the slide, being partition 0 executed in both cores at its corresponding time slots. In this case, a message is sent intercourse, that is partition 0 running in the core 0 and partition 1 running in the core 1, and the message is also sent intracore that is, both partitions running in the same core. This example has no end because of the infinite loop in the sampling port reading of the partition 1. In this final case, the demo shows an example of three partitions, partition 0 and partition 2 running on the core 0 and partition 1 running on the core 1 according to the scheduling displayed. The partition 0 and the partition 1 sort integer arrays of random numbers and send their timing information and their corresponding array to the partition 2 for displaying performance data at the system console. The communication among the partitions is based on queuing channels. Now you can see the system running. First of all, the grmon tool is invoked. Secondly, grmon initializes the hardware. Extratum XNG and the three partitions are loaded after that. Control is given to XNG, which initializes itself and it prepares the three partition memory areas before starting them. The application code execution starts by displaying a red banner explaining the system configuration. Finally, the two processing partitions, 0 and 1, perform their corresponding data sorting operation and send the time information to the displaying partition, number 2. The previous operations are repeated over and over again. To finish this presentation, this is the next work to be performed. First of all, create a demo including Lito's guest OS by Fentis, then create a demo for LVQ Gene by Kines, benchmarks execution over Extratum to compare performance and Linux and RTEMS BSP porting as guest OS, even both of them are out of the scope of the risk. Thank you so much for your attention. Don't forget to follow the risk on social media. Now my colleagues Vicente Nicolau, Senior Manager at Fentes, and Paco Gomez, CEO of Fentes, will answer any questions you may have. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Anna, for your, for your presentation. I see we have no questions in the questions and answer box. I don't know if uh, Paco or, uh, or Vicente want to do any, any final comment about the demo. Uh, well, simply just uh, is to show that the uh, system is up and running. And uh, if somebody is interested in more details of the demos or performance that was asked before, uh, we can provide them. Yes, nothing to add to the words of uh, Paco.
Okay, so so this brings us to the to the end of this workshop. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the the speakers for for their uh, presentations. I, mean, I think that they, they provide a quite nice view of uh, of what the the needs in in, in the space domain are and uh, what the risk is uh, providing as a response to to these needs. I try to summarize a bit here in this uh, slide uh, the, the the goal. I mean, just to be able to provide this uh, first space amenable risk five uh, platform. In principle, it is to build on this risk five uh, open uh, hardware scheme just to avoid the uh, export restrictions to and to also allow the community to to contribute and to and to enrich this uh, the, the, this platforms that uh, were for a I would say a, a small domain where uh, contributions don't come so easy. So this movement to risk five, I think it's uh, something uh, really critical and really important for for future space missions. So you've seen that uh, all builds around this uh, this SOC by Copham Geisler building on, a, on the NOL5 uh, cores and on the Extratum uh, hypervisor and Lithos OS5 Fentis that they uh, provide the, the, the basic software stack to be able to use these platforms in, in space. Then I mean BSC is providing the the enriching support for a for managing a multi-core interference, which is something they really needed not only in space but also in avionics and other domains. Antares is providing the the, the user perspective to to set the requirements, to set the right evaluation of the of the platform, and and, and to really make the the platform reach the the maturity needs. So as said by by Anna and and by others, please. Uh, Keep in contact with us for anything you need, any feedback you have, any question you may you may want to issue. Uh, you have here uh, the details, uh, our web page, uh, as well as the the information about social networks and, and email. So the project will keep running for uh, a bit more than one year until March 2022, uh, and we'll be completing this uh, this first space uh, RISC five based platform. Uh, it will be still in an FPGA, but uh, the goal is to have at some point the transition also to an, an, uh, an ASIC. So thank you very much, everybody, for uh, for listening, uh, for participating, for providing a fruitful discussions uh, with the with the presentations. I think that uh, this made the, the workshop uh, really interesting. And uh, I think I have nothing else on my side. I don't know if any one of my my colleagues wants to comment anything else. If not, uh, I think we can, uh, okay, I have a comment. Okay, I, I think uh, we can uh, now conclude the, the workshop. Thank you very much all for, for being here today and please keep in touch with us for, for anything you need. Thank you very much.